Hello and welcome to Under the Dome from Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier and I'll be one of your program hosts for this year. Under the Dome is Town Meeting TV's coverage of the Vermont Legislature. So we're here in Montpelier today and there's a lot going on at the State House right now. We have a youth-led uh, climate action rally happening just this morning and a lot of legislators are scrambling to get the, the votes passed for their, uh, for their bills as we approach the end of the session. So let's go uh, take a look at what's going on inside the, inside the State House and see what we can find. So each bill that's being considered in this legislative session started in a committee, either in the House or in the Senate. And around the middle of the session in March, there's a deadline called crossover day when all of the bills have to be passed by those committees and then by the entire chamber on one side in order to make it over to the other chamber to be considered by another committee and then passed by that other chamber. So the legislators that we're talking with today are going to be considering legislation that they received from the other chamber that they're now considering on their side of things. And they're also keeping an eye on the legislation that they passed through their committees and their chamber, which is now in the hands of the other chamber. Angela, can you just start by talking a little bit about what committee you serve on and what bills you've worked on this session? I'd be happy to. So uh, my name's Angela Arsenault. I don't know if I need to say that, but uh, I'm on the Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, and we have been working on so many bills this session. We are a proudly prolific committee, I would say. Um, one of the first big bills that we took on was H89, which is the shield bill on the House side. Um, it has a companion bill in the Senate, but uh, that was kind of the, one of the first big bills that, that I've been a part of since this is my first year in the, in the legislature, and that felt really, really good, uh, right, helping, you know, work on something that was aiming at protecting uh, providers of legally protected health care. Um, we've also worked on, in the first part of the session, we worked on a, a group of bills dealing with domestic and sexual violence, um, really working to help and protect survivors and victims as much as possible, giving them different avenues, uh, opening up the avenue to community justice instead of just criminal, the criminal justice system. Um, we have worked on well, I just presented my first floor report yesterday. Um, that was for a bill we got from the Senate, which is S3, uh, a bill that will prohibit uh, paramilitary training facilities. Um, uh, and that passed the House today on third reading. So that'll go back to the Senate uh, and probably, well, I shouldn't say, but possibly be approved there. We only made a few minor changes. So uh, those are just a few of the bills and, and groups of bills that, that I can think of. But uh, we have worked on quite a range, and it's all fascinating. So you mentioned that this is your first term as a legislator. What have you learned about legislating in these first few months? It's funny. I've learned, uh, I can talk about like what I've learned about the mechanics of bill drafting and and committee work and there's that side of things and then there's like just what it means to to me I you know can only speak from my perspective what it means to be in this position and to have the opportunity and the privilege to be in this position um, so I would say uh, what I've learned about on the more mechanical side of things you know there's a really robust collaborative working environment in my committee in the judiciary on the Judi judiciary committee and so it's great to see to know for sure now that um, multiple voices are invited into the room listened to we I have a really wonderful chair representative Lalone from South Burlington um, and he's helped create an environment where everyone can ask their questions. Um, and I think that's so important in this work. <laughs> so I'm really grateful for that. And then on the more kind of personal side of doing this job, um, I've been extremely lucky to come in with a large group of first year legislators, first year representatives especially, and they're just amazing. Like really smart, really curious, really open, really focused on equity and inclusion and uh, really interested in learning, which is such an important part of this. No one comes into this work knowing everything. We know, I would say relatively 
very little about what we're eventually going to be doing. Some of us have a professional background in, in you know, in our, uh, like some folks who worked in healthcare are on the healthcare committee. And, um, but many of us just come in and, and for whatever reason, whatever got us here, there's so much to learn. And uh, it's been so supportive and exciting and, and really kind of really lovely. I mean, it's intense and it's hard, but to do it with a group of people who are, are extremely dedicated um, and so supportive of one another is really, feels really special. Hello, uh, Representative Kate Logan from the Chittenden 16 district that covers most of central Old North End and downtown Burlington. Um, I serve on the House Committee on Environment and Energy. It has a pretty broad scope of policy that we work on, anything that has to do with environmental contamination, pollution, um, recycling, solid waste, um, land use, zoning. Also, kind of anything that would have to do with the climate, as long as it's not related to transportation or agriculture. Uh, so energy policy as well. So we've, ha we've covered a lot of that already this year. Uh, we have passed bills out of committee. Um, most of them have come to the House floor and passed with over 100 votes on um, things like household hazardous waste, making it easier to dispose of household hazardous waste, expanding what counts as household hazardous waste and putting resources into that program. Uh, we have expanded the bottle deposit for recyclables, so more things will um, have a deposit on them and be recyclable in that way, which will ensure a higher quality of recycling materials are coming out of our recycling streams in Vermont. That'll take, uh, that change will take effect in a few years. Um, once that bill is passed, it's called the Bottle Bill. Um, we passed an amazing bill called 30 by 30 on conservation, which would uh, conserve 30% of land in Vermont by 2030 and 50% of Vermont's land by 2050 um, and focus our residential development in areas that are uh, not essential to Vermont's biodiversity. Um, so that's an important study bill. So there's going to be a, an extensive planning process to develop that plan for 30 by 30 and 50 by 50, of course, if it passes out of the Senate. Um, and then the most recent bill we passed out of committee just yesterday is S5, the Affordable Heat Act, which establishes a clean heat standard for heating um, homes and buildings in Vermont, similar to the renewable energy standard that just says like, hey, here's how we want to reduce emissions from this sector. Um, right now, ther the thermal sector uh, contributes almost 40% of carbon emissions in Vermont. So we're trying to reduce that by about 80% by 2050 and trying to create the market conditions that we need in the thermal sector to make that possible as we have done with renewable energy. And right now we're working on <laughs> a housing bill to change zoning to make it possible to more densely develop in our um, historical settlement areas and put resources into affordable housing development in those places. And then we're gonna be moving on to talking about the re renewable energy standard, which was passed in 2015 and needs some updates. Um, so this is your first term as a legislator. Can you just tell us a bit about what you've learned about legislating and uh, what it takes to get bills passed and, and enact change? Oh, th yeah, thanks. I have learned a lot. I had some experience as a community organizer and lobbyist in the past, um, helping to get legislation passed, like the minimum wage increase in Vermont. Um, but on this side of things, uh, I think it's just... The experience of being a legislator has impressed upon me how difficult it is to get as much done as we would like to for a couple of reasons. We only meet for five months, roughly, each year. We're all paid only about $13,000 a year, plus some expenses, um, which makes it fairly inaccessible to a range of different perspectives in the legislature. Um, uh, so, so getting fully educated 
considering every aspect of these really complex issues in a very short period of time, um, and making sure that we're bringing in people into the state house to give perspectives that we ourselves don't hold, um, it's a lot of work. Especially if you've heard the list of things that we've worked on, it means we're all working really long hours, we're learning a lot in a very short period of time, um, and we want to do it well, so we're pushing ourselves really hard, we're working really hard. Um, so it's hard work. <laughs> That's uh, one piece. The other thing is, again, like I mentioned with the the federal government, um, because they're not taking action on things like child care policy, paid family and medical leave insurance, health care, climate, you know, a number of things that we're not seeing big national policy being passed. That means every state in the United States has to do this work on our own. So it's putting it on states like Vermont to develop clean heat standard, for example, that we hope will be adopted in other states, similar to renewable energy standards and like the clean fuel standard that Oregon and California have passed. We're hoping to bring that here into Vermont. So it's a lot of pressure to uh, do what seems like national policy at the state level, but happy to do it. Really glad to be here um, and just wish we all had more time or needed less sleep. <laughs> thank you so much, Kate. Taylor, thank you for joining us. Uh, can you just share a little bit about what committee you serve on and what uh, bills you've been championing this session? Absolutely. So I get the privilege to serve on the House Human Services Committee, which focuses on the full agency of human services. And really, our work it directly impacts Vermonters, especially some of our most vulnerable Vermonters. And so this year, speaking of vulnerable Vermonters, uh, we took up Adult Protective Services and uh, rewriting that full statute and making sure that it was working in the favor of the people who are going to be uh, using that process, especially using uh, plain language in those discussions for folks with developmental disabilities um, or who need additional uh, support in knowing the process, which most state processes are complicated to begin with. Other things that we're taking up is uh, overdose prevention, knowing that again this year Vermont sent a record for the number of overdose deaths uh, due to opioids. And so we passed H222, uh, which took some smaller steps, incremental change on um, access to treatment, uh, barriers in the field, and uh, expanding harm reduction services for the state. But I'm really excited that in uh, the next week we're going to be taking up overdose prevention sites, uh, something that we tried to do last year but uh, was vetoed by the governor coming back to it again this year and really understanding that we need bold change we need bold action to prevent overdose deaths in the state of Vermont you mentioned the importance of plain language um, I think um, so CCTV uh, houses the Vermont language justice project and so we're really we try to stay tuned into the ways that um, language justice is moving more forward in the state and the ways that the state of Vermont is advancing language access and language justice do you you know can you speak to the ways that uh, Ver the state of Vermont is making um, you know is is, adva is considering language access or um, what's kind of being done to make sure that people who don't speak English as their first language or able to benefit from you know the, the resources that our state has? Oh, absolutely. Um, plain language, which has become a common theme across bills that we've been considering this year, especially when it comes to notifications directly to Vermonters. We don't want it to be complicated. We want folks to understand the information that's coming from the state. But I do also have to acknowledge that we have a long way to go when it comes to language access here in Vermont. And I'm really grateful that we have the Office of Racial Equity in the governor's office that is focusing on these key pieces. Uh, Susanna Davis and her office has now released two reports, one in 2020 and the most recent one on language access and policy changes as well as departmental changes that need to happen in order for Vermonters who either uh, are multilingual and uh, don't speak English. What I hear directly actually from my constituents in Winooski is that we take for granted this privilege of being able to read in our uh, native tongue. And what a majority of refugees and new Americans are coming in and saying is, I know how to speak my language, I don't fully know how to read my language. And so when we're putting out all of these written materials, we think that we're doing our best work. We've translated it into languages uh, that are spoken here in the state, and yet, 
that spoken piece is the most important. And that's where our, our growing edge is, is really leaning into multimedia, just like town meeting TV, and providing video descriptions um, or providing opportunities for folks to meet with a navigator who can explain it all out for them. So you also serve on the discrimination panel. Can you tell us a little bit about what that panel does and what you're up to there? Yes, so the discrimination prevention panel uh, was established in recognizing that we are a self-regulating body, meaning that uh, there are no um, outside sources of kind of checks and balances when it comes to the membership of the General Assembly. Um, we are the ones who would put impose any actions such as censure or expulsion, but also making sure that we're creating a safe and equitable work environment for everyone here, uh, both uh, folks in the General Assembly and the staff as well. And so the discrimination prevention panel is majority response to discrimination or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, reports of discrimination that are coming up in the state house, as well as putting through a very thorough policy as to what we want to see for the state house and the culture here, um, and training for our members. So so far this year, we've gone through that policy and tried to parse out what discrimination looks like, what it is, what it isn't, and then uh, are continuing to work with the Office of Racial Equity to continue uh, discrimination prevention trainings, which I believe will happen in the next year. So my name is Representative Carol Odie. I'm on the House Ways and Means Committee. Currently we're working on the child care bill this very week. Um, well, f how we're getting all the background so we know how we will uh, attempt to finance that program. We um, were personally what I've championed is the um, no, banning child marriage under the age of 18 and that passed the House, went to the Senate, passed there, came back and made just a small minor tweak in the House and now it is uh, a bill that has completely passed both chambers and it's on its way to the governor's desk. Hi, I'm Tiff Bloomley, uh, and I represent the South End of Burlington, and um, I, I'm on the Appropriations Committee, and it's my first year there. And, you know, our sole job is to uh, pass the budget um, and legislation with appropriations in them. And it is a fascinating, incredibly complex process. Uh, I basically spent two months um, in one room um, with all of my colleagues uh, hearing testimony from a variety of people about the budget and what should be in it uh, and working with committees um, uh, to understand what they think should be in the budget and a priority. Uh, and we got the budget passed through the House just a couple weeks ago and it's in the Senate and they probably are having their way with it and we'll get it back and we will have a conference um, over any differences so yeah uh, back from you. thank you both so much um, so there's a lot of big investments uh, you know sort of proposed by Democrats in the budget this year uh, child care paid family medical leave Can you talk a little bit about how we're gonna pay for that as a state well, <clears throat> we, we would both have kind of complementary answers because, it, you know, some of it is um, uh, on Carol's end, which is ways and means and raising revenues um, in different ways. And some of it is through <clears throat> income we know that has already been forecast we are going to have um, through the various taxes that we levy, plus carry forward money from the prior year, plus um, some remaining ARPA um, re recovery money. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the big investments, I mean, we're talking about passing child care legislation, um, paid family leave uh, uh, insurance, and um, <clears throat> major housing um, legislation. And that, you know, that will cost money. And we happen to have surpluses um, that Carol can talk about on the tax side, but surpluses um, and ARPA money that can fund some of the infrastructure stuff um, related to building housing. Um, plus, we're, you know, um, 
Well, no, I think that's, I think, I think that's really, I've covered the ground. But you, Carol. <laughs> well, well, one thing that we are all committed to is spending one-time money on one-time um, obligations so that we don't obligate ourselves going into the future with money that wouldn't be replicated. Um, for paid family medical leave insurance, we are looking at one half of a percent on the payroll where the employer would choose whether the employer would pay the full half a percent or would share that with the employee. And then on, and um, as long as you're an employer who offers um, benefits that are equal to what we're asking to be provided, then you would not have to be part of that program. Um, so you can opt out if you want by providing those benefits. Um, on the um, child care, that is a, a bigger bill, a big bill. Um, uh, what I mean is it's a huge amount of money that we have to come up with. And um, we're, we're just now just briefly looking at um, the old tax, Blue Ribbon Tax Commission report and uh, of 2011, I think, and then another one um, that was more recent, maybe 2020. And we're taking into account what they have said about how taxation in Vermont might look going forward. We, um, we've got a tax system that doesn't necessarily reflect how people are, um, are, paying, are spending money today. For example, um, we have sales tax, but we don't have tax on very many services. So both of those commission reports said maybe you should expand to cover some services that aren't currently covered, not all, but some, and then um, lower the tax on sales, a uh, little combination. But we have, that that's one of the things that we looked at um, last week, and um, n nothing is um, been decided at all. We're just trying to get a lay of the land. Um, but we're very much committed to uh, helping with childcare. And um, what was the other thing that you, <clears throat> go ahead. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, it, it is a, an investment that we are making that is not one time, that I think is really critical. Um, that was a key priority of the, both the healthcare and the human services committees. And that is investing in service providers in our communities who are doing the work that we desperately need them to do. So the social workers, doctors, nurses, etc. <clears throat> we have um, we have maintained Medicaid reimbursement rates at a certain level that has made it almost untenable for the organizations that run these services. And this year, we've made a big commitment to them, um, recognizing that we cannot continue to afford to do this. And of course, this is this issue is really um, <clears throat> pushed forward by the fact that getting get, getting people to fill those jobs is really hard. Why? Because they don't pay enough uh, to live on. So I just, it's something that people don't think about. It's not, doesn't capture a lot of attention. It's not shiny, but it's critical. Um. Uh, something else I would say is what we are doing is we are bringing the priorities of Vermonters to the state house. These are not our individual priorities. These are when we go door to door and when we have listening sessions, you know, by Zoom, um, and, or at our NPA meetings for Burlington, um, we are listening to what people are saying. And they are saying that they want jobs that pay enough so that their families, their children and grandchildren, can decide to live in Vermont and stay in Vermont. And they need access to childcare. These are the people who are coming to the doors to talk to us. They need, their children need access to childcare health care, um, affordable housing, and um, time off when they're, they have a child, um, and ha um, that they are able to care for their, for their parents if their parents are ill. So these are things that we have heard um, from, from our, our, uh, our, the people who live we're in the places we represent. Um, 
<laughs> there was another thing. Oh, and a mental health system of care that works, and of course, public safety and the situation in downtown Burlington, it can be very difficult right now. So um, we are really trying hard to find uh, wraparound services and housing for people who are currently on the street. And that can mean mental health care, substance abuse um, care, and things like that.